Greetings, fellow space citizens. I'm Jim Cooper. I'm here today as a member of AGI's ComSpot Corporation, and I'll be bringing to you today our latest SpaceCast. Uh, we're trying something a little bit different today. This is our first time that we're going to do a one-man show. I'm here in the studio uh, by myself, essentially, and I'm not going to be interviewed or anything. I'll just be talking with you guys through this. Uh, as we talk about, essentially, we're going to be talking about large constellations, the new large constellations of satellites that are coming. Uh, but it'll be just me to, today, and we'll, we'll see how that works out for a new format for our SpaceCast. Um, as I said, I want to talk to you guys a little bit today about uh, what's going on, large constellations of satellites. I know this is something that's been in the news a lot uh, over the last year or two. And we just kind of want to address some of the things that we're seeing here from our perspective uh, and some of the analysis that we do. Now, we've done some of this before. I know that we've presented in the past where we've shown various videos of debris clouds in LEO and debris clouds in GEO. And we've even done large constellations in the past. Uh, but of course, those are being routinely and regularly updated uh, as more companies jump into the space game. They want to get a piece of the action, so to speak. They've got new and innovative and, and entrepreneurial ideas. And so they're creating these new concepts. And as they create these new concepts and begin the design and start to move down the path, of course, they have to file uh, for being able to launch those satellites into space. So what I want to show you here is essentially a video that we've done. A, a version of this has been done in the past. But what we're doing it now is redoing the video to kind of show you what the latest filings look like. We'll go ahead and bring that video up right now. And this is our latest large constellation video. And you'll see what's going to happen here. This video is going to populate by year uh, over on the left with the number of satellites in these various constellations by these companies that are going up each year. And you can kind of see those numbers grow and how drastic that they get as you move through the course of the next decade. And of course, this includes things like the SpaceX Starlink constellation, the OneWeb satellites, which are here listed under Worldview. Uh, you know, the Boeing satellites, Amazon and everything. Recently, the last time we did this video, these numbers reflected something in the neighborhood of, if I remember right, 48 or 50,000. What you're seeing now is a drastic increase, and we're actually looking at over 100,000 satellites uh, that are supposed to be launched over the next decade, right, from now through the year 2029. And you can kind of see as that video builds out right there and what that looks like. Now, to be sure, the video I just showed you is for public filing. So we don't really know, again, which of these are going to actually succeed to being operational, flight capable, and, and up and operating as constellations. However, even uh, any substantial amount of these that makes it, if it's 20%, 30%, 50%, you know, give it some number. If it's a substantial percentage of all those satellites, that's going to obviously represent a, a sea change or, I don't know, a space change maybe is a better term here, uh, in the actual uh, operational environment today and the concerns that we have today as a result of this burgeoning space population. Now. Since I'm the only one in the studio today and there's nobody here to do this, I'm going to go ahead and ask myself a question. Well, Jim, that's interesting. That was a lot of dots on that screen. What does that all mean? You know, Jim, that's a fantastic question. That's a great question. Let me, let me show you what that means right now. I want to bring up a slide here. This is something we've also done in the past of sort of doing an assessment of what all of those dots look like. And what we're doing is we're now redoing this. We've done this assessment all over again to account for the increased numbers that are reflected in that video that you've just seen. And so I want to run through this. This is kind of a numbers chart, but when you really dig into the numbers, it's, it's alarming. It's eye-opening, to say the least. And, and again, I know we've done this before, but I'll do it for you here again. I'm just going to grab one particular constellation uh, of satellites. Let's look at the SpaceX M-T uh, segment there, which is going to have 20,940 spacecraft operating in that area right there. And what we've done is we've looked at the encounter rates for that group of satellites in today's current resident space object catalog. So that RSO number is what you see right here at the top. That reflects the catalog as it exists today under today's sort of global capabilities, which are essentially tracking and maintaining objects down to about 10 centimeters in LEO, where the SpaceX constellation our uh, Starlink constellation will be. And if you look at that encounter rate, what you can see is that there is a chance, if you look at the collisions over the next 10 year period, they're going to have essentially 43 collisions, actual things colliding, coming together in space with that constellation 
operating inside today's current RSO catalog of objects that's up there. Analogous to that, if they decide for operational purposes that they want to receive a warning anytime something comes within three kilometers of one of their satellites, they're going to receive over 13, almost 14 million warnings in this 10-year period. And if we take that a step further and they decide, again, just for operational pur purposes, that they want to maneuver whenever anything approaches within one kilometer of one of these satellites, they're going to have to perform a million and a half collision avoidance maneuvers. Now, that's already operationally untenable from an operation standpoint. If you are continuing to use today's standards and today's processes for space flight safety, it's kind of a heads up warning, if you will. Uh, and it's already kind of operationally untenable from that standpoint. If we carry that to the next step over on the right side of this chart and you look at a RSO, Resonant Space Object Catalog, of 200,000 or more. Now, this would reflect some of the newer capabilities that are coming online, some of the commercial capabilities, military capabilities like the new U.S. Space Force Space Fence Radar, which is tracking small debris down into the, you know, single centimeter, not one centimeter, but single digit, if you will, you know, somewhere around one, two, three, four, five, something like that centimeter sized targets. You're going to see this catalog that's currently up there today of objects go up. These are all the satellites that are there today. We're just not tracking or haven't tracked them in the past because the capabilities weren't there. But in the future they will. They're starting to come online right now. So we're already going to see the catalog grow. And so if we now compare the SpaceX constellation, the Starlink constellation that we referenced, with this new currently existing catalog expanded to account for all that small debris, you see what those new numbers look like. We're upwards of 400 collisions over a 10-year period with one of those pieces of debris, 157 million warnings, and 17 million plus maneuvers to avoid collisions, right? So obviously, that's all operationally untenable. And what that's driving really is the need for better spaceflight safety, essentially building up a regime for space traffic management. And from a technical standpoint, that's going to drive the need for things like advanced analytics, comprehensive data fusion to be able to essentially automatically ingest and process data across all formats and phenom phenomenologies and standards so that you can work with all the authoritative data that's out there, and realistic error portrayals. You need this stuff so that you can essentially make correct, uh, essentially informed decision quality uh, with decision quality information, you can make informed decisions on whether or not to maneuver. Obviously, when you maneuver, you're expending fuel, uh, you are coming off a particular operation or a customer support. There are reasons that you don't want to maneuver, and you only want to maneuver when you really have to for spaceflight safety. So we need to bring some of these new capabilities on board to deal with that and to provide that level of decision quality information to make well-informed decisions for spaceflight safety purposes. Now, of course, the U.S., uh, from a governmental standpoint, has recognized this. Uh, two years ago now, they released SPD-3, Space Policy Doctrine, uh, Space Policy Document Number 3, which dealt with space traffic management. At the time, uh, SPD-3 assigned the, uh, the, from a writ large standpoint, there are numerous roles and responsibilities across the board from an operations standpoint and management standpoint. Uh, some things on, uh, on research and development, international cooperation, everything. But writ large, uh, SPD-3 at the time assigned the main responsibility for this to the Office of Space Commerce in the Department of Commerce. Uh, last year, to become more informed on this, of course, Congress uh, commissioned the National Academy of Public Administration to perform a study to look at space traffic management from a roles and responsibility standpoint and from an organizational standpoint to best understand where that should go. And that study was made public last week. And they confirmed that probably, uh, not probably, they confirmed that Office of Space Commerce is uh, probably the most uh, correct or most appropriate organization to take this on, uh, given the factors that they looked at. Uh, so uh, that seems to back up what SPD3 said. They also noted in their study that this is a critical capability that we need to move out on without delay. Uh, and we all agree with that uh, here at AGI Comspot Corporation. We're hoping as responsible uh, space operators, everybody else agrees with that as well. There seems to be a burgeoning discussion on this, uh, one that has kind of moved past the idea that this is a problem. I think it's accepted as a problem. Uh, and the conversation has now moved into what do we do about the problem? How do we implement solutions? And that's a good place to be. 
and that's where we need to continue to take this. So with all of that, that kind of brings you guys all up to speed here on, uh, on where we are. This is obviously a dynamic situation. Uh, I'm sure it's going to continue to unfold. There's going to continue to be entrepreneurial efforts out there, new ideas, new concepts. That's all great stuff. That's what we want. Uh, that's great for space, uh, great for all, you know, world economies and everything like that. So we want to see that continue. Uh, what that's going to mean, obviously, is these numbers are going to change over time even more. And when that happens, I'm sure we'll be coming back to you uh, with, uh, with updated information, updated videos, updated assessments. We'll continue to keep you guys up to speed on all of that. And with that, I think that's all of the, uh, all of the information that we've got to broadcast to you today. Uh, we thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoy the new format here. And with that, uh, we will sign off. Take care, everybody. Have a wonderful Space Day. The end.